Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch and welcome to something I've never done before. I'm going to unbox a watch and modify it straight out of the box and I bought it knowing that I was going to do exactly that to it. It also comes with a bit of a confession. Now, if you remember before Christmas, I made a What's in the Watch Roll video detailing the watches that I was going to take on my Queensland Christmas road trip. All of those watches were Seikos. I told you I was going to take my orange 5K XGMT and wear it on Christmas Day, which I did. My beloved Saab 033 and the Perpetual Calendar Quartz review coming soon. Now, the fourth watch in that video was my blue Street Series Tuna. I even showed you the piece of sapphire crystal I was going to modify it with when I got back. Except I made the video two days before I went on my road trip and I sold the tuna the day before I went on my road trip to buy another Street Series tuna. Ah, the madness that is this hobby. Blue has never really been my colour despite many previous attempts and when I saw a steel and grey one pop up for a cracking price from a local retailer, I had an epiphany, sold the blue one for a loss and bought the grey one. I know what I'm like with blue watches, it just wouldn't have seen much wrist time, whereas the grey at least has a fighting chance. Now, unfortunately, the piece of sapphire that I had had blue AR undercoating, so I had to buy a second piece of sapphire with clear AR undercoating for the grey one. I just don't think it would have looked right otherwise. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to take this grey street series tuna out of the box for the first time, then put it straight under the knife, so to speak. Sapphire isn't a hard mod generally to do, but I have never modded one of these Seiko Quartz movements, so it will still be a bit of a learning curve, I'm sure. Let's flip the camera and get modding. All right, you know what it is, and you know what I'm gonna do to it when I get into it, so let's get into it. So Aussie AD stock with Aussie AD warranty, so three years, and I was able to pass the previous blue tuna on with about two years and nine months remaining on its warranty, which is nice. Now, added bonus, this is an SNE 541J. So I went from a P1 to a J1, this one not just having a Japanese movement, the Caliber 157. It has been made in Japan, entirely manufactured in Japan. Apparently this gray one was a JDM version according to the retailer. To be honest, that wasn't really a factor for me. That wasn't part of my thinking. I just bought it because of the way it looks. Now, you may remember I had some issues with the blue one. The movement was behaving rather erratically for the first 10 minutes or so until it got some decent solar charge. This one, the crown's out. Let's push it in. And there we go. No such problems with this one. Yeah, these Street Series are not new models, so any stock you're buying in 2022 or indeed 2023 is going to be having sat in a warehouse lurking in its box for a number of years, so don't be surprised if these solar movements do take a little bit of time to adjust to their new surroundings. Yeah, that is much more my cup of tea. That stainless steel bezel is gorgeous. All right, so turbo speed Seiko SNE 541J1 Street Series Tuna from the Prospects line. 46.7 mil in diameter, it is a big boy, but only 12 mil thick because it's solar quartz and only 46 mil lug to lug. Now that is the key dimension. That is why this one wears really nicely on me, wears really nicely on people who don't have enormous wrists. 22 millimeter lug width, it's supplied on one of these nice, if a little bit thick and bulky Seiko silicone straps. Now it's got a, it's got a silicone retainer on this one and it's got a fairly plain brushed buckle and tang for hardware. Seiko branded, but on the underside rather than some other tuners that I've owned, which have had more elaborate metal buckles and tang and metal retainers. Not a lot of weight to it though, 98 grams as supplied. Screw down crown, 200 meters of water resistance and ISO rated because this one is a prospects. It's divers with an apostrophe, 200 meters. Now I am gonna take the back off of this one, replace the crystal. I feel confident with my own work. Plus, it's not really going to see more than two meters of depth in my hands in the future. Unidirectional 120 click dive time rotating bezel. Now, this watch does have a stainless steel case underneath the shroud. 
Why would you take the shroud off though? You can do with three small hex head bolts on the side, but it is so much a Seiko Tuna signature, I would tend to leave it on. This is made of some kind of ceramic composite material from my research the last time I owned a Tuna a couple of years ago. You can correct me if I'm wrong though, please, I'm sure you will. That means that they will shatter these shrouds. They can replace them with stainless steel ones, but again, I wouldn't bother with that myself. Now there's a loom pip here because this one is ISO certified and the date is down there at four o'clock, meaning you still get those four big indices after dark at the 12, the three, the six, and the nine. Talking of after dark, it's pretty good. Seiko's Lumi Bright. It is the bluey style of Lumi Bright rather than the greeny style of Lumi Bright. Everything's just painted on, the indices and the loom are therefore painted on. Get to the end of the 20 minute test period, yeah, it's still pretty good. Not stellar, but not bad considering the price I paid. In case you're wondering, that price was 269 Aussie dollars, so just under 200 USD. That's pretty good for a Seiko Prospects these days. Standard screw on high polished stainless steel case back by Seiko and the VK157 movement as mentioned, plus or minus 15 seconds per month accuracy because it's solar quartz and eight months battery charge when fully charged in the sunshine. And hallelujah, everything lines up pretty neatly on this model, the loom pip, the chapter ring, and that second hand hits every single marker. Very satisfying indeed. On wrist, it's big, but it doesn't wear big thanks to that compact lug to lug. And let's face it, under 100 grams for a watch this size is really pretty good. Now the strap is comfortable, but it is a little bit bulky. I will probably change that out for something else in due course. And just before I mod it, here is a little bit of macro footage that I shot in this standard original straight out of the box form with the flat hard lex crystal. Now top down, you can barely see the crystal there at all. And from certain angles, again, it pretty much disappears, which is great. But from other angles, all you get is bounce back. Now that is not necessarily because it's hard lex mineral, it's because it's flat. And again, from these dynamic and on wrist shots, you can see it is rather variable whether you get a beautiful crystal clear shot of the dial and hands, or you end up with a lot of reflection and a lot of bounce back. So it's a double upgrade today in some senses from mineral to sapphire, which is much more scratch proof, and also from flat to domed, hoping to avoid a lot of this bounce back. Right, one watch and one sapphire crystal. I got the sapphire on Ali, I paid just over $50 for it. I'll leave a link in the description of the video. It's the same piece of sapphire I bought for the blue tuna that I didn't end up using. Pretty basic set of tools today. Case holder there, case back removal tool, little spring bar removal tool, crystal press and various dies and a puffer should I get any dust into the case at any point today. And one more piece of equipment, gloves from the beginning. No sticky fingers here, please. Okay, drilled lugs make it nice and easy to take the original strap off. I'm gonna replace that anyway with something from my shoebox full of straps. Screw the head of the watch into this rather agricultural looking little device. I find these cheap twin prong case back removal tools, they cost like three bucks, do 95% of the case back that I encounter. And thankfully, this is one of the 95. Now I haven't modified a quartz before as mentioned, but it's the same principle. There's a little uh, lever there you have to depress, depress the lever, the crown pops straight out. Now some gentle pressure, a little bit of a prying pressure all the way around and the movement and dial and hands all pop straight out as well. Don't forget the chapter ring. The chapter ring isn't attached to the dial and hands here, so I'm gonna have to put that back in later. And there is the case ready to have the crystal removed. Now, which way does the crystal come out? I reckon like 95% of the crystals I've dealt with, it comes out from the front. Select the correct dies back and front, give it a squeeze, there's a satisfying but terrifying crack and the hard lex comes straight out. So open up the new sapphire crystal with those gloves on, no smudges again, please, and just gently seat it. Find the right dies for this one, and it's not quite the same. You don't get that crack on the way in, or at least I didn't. It's more just gentle pressure, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. I didn't take the original gasket out of the case, it stayed in the case, so nice and simple. All right, reassembly all going so well so far. The chapter ring had four little notches in it. They lined up with four little notches on the dial and I slotted it in roughly in position where the crown is going to go at the four o'clock. The crown itself will pull the dial and chapter ring into position should I have got slightly askew by half a degree or thereabouts. 
Everything seemed nice and neat. Pop the crown in. There was another little movement holder, a little green plate that I squeezed on the back. Now, just hand tight to check everything. It's all lined up to check that the crown is working. I pulled it in, pushed it out, etc. It's all working nicely. Okay. Right, now time to tighten up the case back, make it good and proper in case I do go swimming with this one at some point in the future. Strap change. The original Seiko one's soft, but it is a bit bulky. I found this Barton Elite silicone in black with nice matching gunmetal hardware that couldn't have gone better. I didn't even know I had this one, but there you go. Quick release these Barton silicones. They're very, very comfortable and very easy to swap on and off. Well, easy to swap on and off if you get it right, Jody. Second time lucky, that's it. And there we are, folks. That is strap change and sapphire crystal install almost done on the tuna. Pick off the little sapphire sticker, give it a bit of a polish, jobs are good and another watch that I haven't managed to make a total arse of while modding. So that's it. I appreciate it has gone from a 270 Aussie dollar watch to about a 350 Aussie dollar watch, but I did want to have one of these tuners long term and yeah, I'm much happier with this one with that lovely stainless steel bezel than the previous blue model, and even happier now that it's got sapphire crystal covering the dial, and it's got a super comfortable and not nearly as bulky strap for me. And these are the after shots. I can't replicate the light conditions, but I can replicate the, the rough angles. You'll never eliminate Flecto, that's not what Sapphire does, but you will eliminate that complete flat bounce back that you get from a piece of flat crystal. I always think Sapphire adds a more luxurious look, which is just as well, because like I said, it cost me 50 Aussie to add the piece of crystal. But yeah, various benefits and a lovely look is definitely one of them. Thanks for making it all the way to the back end of the video. If you want to watch me not make a mess of modding another couple of Seikos, click here or here. All the best, and I'll see you again soon.